Good afternoon. I'm Adrian Dix, uh, BC Minister of Health. Uh, beside me to my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, our Provincial Health Officer in British Columbia. Uh, we're honored to be here on the traditional territories of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Just to give you a sense of um, schedule for the next uh, couple of days, uh, tomorrow we'll be doing, we'll be briefing at 10.30 in the morning, uh, the briefing that has been promised about uh, modeling. And uh, that will be preceded by a technical briefing, an off-record technical briefing at 9 o'clock, and you'll get information from that. Members of the media will in, um, in, uh, by email. The, um, on, uh, later on tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock, we'll be releasing our regular daily statement, which will give information about case counts and so on for that day so that you'll have that information. And then uh, at noon on Saturday, we'll be back briefing. So there'll be one uh, substantial um, uh, session tomorrow where all questions, of course, can be asked. There'll be written information at 3 o'clock. And then on Saturday, uh, there'll be a new briefing. So uh, with that, I want to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, so a couple of things on the agenda for today. But first off, uh, we have had uh, 66 new cases um, in the last uh, in the last 24 hours, uh, bringing our total up to 725 here in British Columbia test positive cases. That includes 359 in Vancouver Coastal Health, for, uh, 241 in the Fraser Health region, 52 uh, here on Vancouver Island, 62 in Interior Health, and 11 now in the Northern Health region. As you are aware, we have nine long-term care facility outbreaks that are ongoing. Um, there's no change in that number today. Um, and all of the stats stay the same with the exception of the two. Uh, one, the Lynn Valley Care Center, we've had an increase in uh, four residents and three additional health care workers who have tested positive. And in Harrow Park, um, we have an increase of two residents and one additional staff member who's tested positive in that outbreak. All of the others continue to be investigated and managed. Um, of our 725 cases, the, we now have 66 people in hospital in BC. And mm -hmm. of those, 26 are in the intensive care unit. And 186 people are fully recovered. We have no new deaths today, thankfully. Um, a couple of things that have come out in the last day or so. Uh, one, of course, is uh, one that you may have heard of. We have new prescriber guidelines um, to support people who use drugs and people who have issues with substance use disorder or addictions. And this is particularly to uh, support people in uh, places like the downtown east side who may be affected by COVID-19. And so these guidelines are to enable us to provide a safe supply for people and to ensure that they're able to comply with our, our, our public health advice around isolation or quarantine should that be required. So I think that's a very important piece to help uh, ensure that we can support people um, in, uh, in those situations as best we can. Uh, in addition, um, I mentioned in yesterday's briefing, I've made two additional orders under the Public Health Act in BC. One is uh, enables health sector workers at all public and private facilities to remain at one facility only for the duration of the, the pandemic. This includes long-term care, assisted living, um, extended and acute care. So this is one of the key things that we've talked about as being a risk, particularly for our more vulnerable elders and seniors who are in care homes or in assisted living, where we've had a, a patchwork system of care providers, um, health care workers of various different kinds who move between facilities. And that is one of the things that has facilitated um, movement uh, and outbreaks in a number of different facilities, unfortunately. Um, so far in British Columbia. So this will be really important to help support those workers to be able um, to work and to maintain um, the, the support that we need in those facilities with decreasing that risk. So decreasing the potential for transmission both between healthcare workers but also uh, most importantly between facilities. Um, 
the other thing that uh, was announced earlier this morning, which you, you would have heard, is that Minister Farnworth has uh, come out with a number of, of enhanced provisions and made it quite clear around the uh, Provincial Emergency Declaration under the Emergency Programs Act. And I'm really pleased that uh, he has done some things that have defined um, essential work uh, for the province, and this will help clarify things. As I know, a number of different municipalities were looking at different definitions of who essential workers were and what types of essential services we needed. As well, there are enhanced powers um, to enforce the orders that we have in place in British Columbia, whether they're orders for isolation, um, quarantine for people who have returned, uh, returning travelers. And along with that, the Government of Canada has now um, uh, determined that they are going to use the Quarantine Act to enforce a 14-day quarantine for all travelers entering Canada. So that uh, became effective as of last night. And we uh, are and will be working with them to ensure that we can align our enforcement of these orders if needed. And I think it's, uh, you know, we've said before, um, although it was uh, it was an expectation at the provincial, uh, the federal level. It has been an order for people here in British Columbia, and we have um, had good compliance with this order. Although in a couple of occasions we've need to enforce it. So every day that we stay home, that we do what we have been asked to do, we stay apart but staying connected, brings us a day closer to being able to to manage this response. There are still many, many things that we can do and we should be doing together. We can connect with friends online. We can share stories about our day. We can share pictures. We can share videos. We can have celebrations together virtually. And, uh, and there's lots of those that have been examples lately of people having birthdays where their community can celebrate without having the physical connectedness that puts people at risk. We can all make a difference, but we need everyone to be 100% um, committed to doing this. That doesn't mean 100% of people all have to stay in their house, but each and every one of us needs to right now make that commitment to stay away from people who are vulnerable, to stay at home when we can, to go out for essential things only, to make sure that we are able to provide those essential services if you're a healthcare worker, if you work in a grocery store. We're depending on you, but we need you to do that safely, and that means maintaining the physical distance between people. But we also need to continue to coming together as a community and to do that virtually. So we need to take care of each other right now. We need to be kind, and we need everybody to do their part. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Henry. As Dr. Henry has said, we now have uh, 725 confirmed cases in British Columbia. That's up 66 uh, from yesterday's report. 66 people, the same number, are currently in hospital, and that's an increase of two. And 26 people currently in ICU. 14 people have died from COVID-19 in British Columbia. I wanted to update on a couple of um, facts that are occurring out there. First of all, I want to thank the incredible team of patient navigators and nurses at 811. For the first time yesterday, we answered uh, calls answered 5,070, and the average wait time yesterday uh, was 5.3 minutes, which is reflects the extraordinary number of both new staff and the commitment of those staff that have uh, that we've seen at 811, which is enormously helpful to people as they deal. Um, with uh, both the anxiety around COVID-19 and the reality of feeling sick in BC at a difficult time. I wanted to um, uh, note as well, and this is, um, this is of interest, I think, to people that we have now have more registrants in BC, people who have come back and registered as doctors and nurses, 26 doctors and 248 nurses. And, uh, and uh, as well, we have many care aides who have joined and rejoined uh, in support of health care facilities in BC. And all I can say, and I want to speak for Dr. Henry and the Premier and the whole government, is how much we appreciate how much that demonstrates our, our shared commitment and the extraordinary commitment of all health care workers to the care of people in BC. Uh, finally, I wanted to note that we have, um, uh, we have as of uh, as of March 26th, as of today, 
3,903 uh, total beds vacant in the acute care system in BC, that the current occupancy is 63.6 percent overall. The current occupancy of critical care beds is 54.8 percent, which is pretty consistent, and the total vacant critical care beds are 371. Uh, tomorrow um, will be uh, Dr. Henry and uh, Stephen Brown and myself will be uh, providing some briefing on, on what we've t described as modeling, which is uh, to let people know uh, some of the models of what could be expected in BC, including what we see based on BC data, but also uh, taking worst case scenarios. So, what you're going to see tomorrow is our preparations in the face of what could be worst case scenarios in BC. Uh, in, in comparison to places such as Hubei and Italy. Um, there has uh, obviously been a lot of concern and talk about, about uh, personal protective equipment. Um, I wanted to say that uh, obviously there's huge international demand for PPE and a lot of disruption in what you would call the global manufacturing uh, capacity and all the supply chains that all of us use. But our primary focus is to protect healthcare workers and it's our determination to continue to do so. How are we managing that? Well, by conserving and uh, micromanaging our existing inventory, and there's a number of steps we've taken to do that to ensure that um, the, right, the, the equipment is, is there and in place and prepared and can be moved around quickly for the needs of our teams and our staff. And finally, securing supply and sources of PPE. We have received and we are receiving small sub uh, sources of supply, both from the national uh, government and the National Bank of Supply. And also, um, and also small sources of supply that we have received. Obviously, we are working um, very diligently and have been um, virtually every, day, every hour of every day to uh, also uh, seek new sources of supply as well. And uh, that is, uh, I'm sure, a situation of concern to all healthcare workers. And we want them to know that we're thinking of them and supporting them every day on that question. And there may be more questions about that. When we have uh, when we have a question period, I want to just talk briefly. Substance use disorders who are infected with, have confirmed exposure to, or otherwise need to self-isolate in the context of COVID-19. It provides a number of options for opioid use disorder, provides guidance for ongoing patient support and voice contact during self-isolation, and for safe delivery of the medications in the context of COVID-19. We all know, and you're all aware, that British Columbia is facing two public health emergencies. And this world-leading treatment protocol is strongly connected to both emergencies at the same time, a necessary public health measure to assist patients to self-isolate and help their community. As I said, you'll be hearing significantly more from that and some detail uh, from uh, Judy Darcy. And I can tell you that while well, the guidance protocol originated with the team at Vancouver Coastal Health, it has been unanimously endorsed by all the stakeholders for the BCCSU, including the Ministry of Health, to adapt, adopt, adapt as a provincial guidance. And, uh, and uh, I want to express my appreciation for the leadership of my colleague, Minister Darcy, and the whole team involved in that question. And um, with that, I just say uh, two more things. One, our continuing concern about care homes is reflected in the order uh, made by uh, the provincial health officer today, which will be followed up uh, by, uh, by the work of uh, medical health officers and a number of health authorities. It's critical to, to protect people in care and it's critical to ensure that people are not working in multiple care homes. And that's the intent of that order and it's of central importance. And I wanted to, again, uh, express my appreciation, especially to both uh, providers of care, both public and nonprofit and private, all combined, and especially to the Hospital Employees Union for their leadership. I want to say finally that what we do today matters. Physical distance and self-isolation and everything Dr. Henry is telling us to do matters. It matters today. And it matters for the days, the weeks, and the months ahead. This will be a difficult time, as difficult as we've ever seen as a province. But we know this. If we do what we're asked, if we do what is right, 
we can take the steps we need to bend the curve to ensure that all of us have the resources to deal with this really unprecedented in our lifetimes public health emergency. The action we take today matter, and you'll see this um, tomorrow as well. They're what will help us help save the ones we love, perhaps, tomorrow. Working apart, we're standing together. The distance between us unites us. I've said it before, and I'll continue to say it. Dr. Henry just said it to you. We need 100 percent of us to be all in, 100 percent of the time. In, in the days today and all the days and weeks ahead, we have to work 100 percent as a whole society from each individual in every community in every corner of BC to the provincial government, to the federal government, to the municipal governments, all of us have to be all in to do what we can to, to defeat COVID-19. And with that, I'll take your questions. Oh, wait, one more thing. Just a few words in French. Nous avons enceint 66 nouveaux cas de COVID-19 aujourd'hui pour un total de 725 cas en Colombie-Britannique. Chaque régie de santé de la Colombie-Britannique compte des patients atteints de COVID-19. 359 se trouvent à Vancouver Coastal, 241 à Fraser, 52 sur l'île de Vancouver, 62 dans l'intérieur et 11 au nord. Neuf établissements de, de soins de longue durée dans les régies de santé de Vancouver Coastal et Fraser ont confirmé des cas de COVID-19. Les responsables de la santé publique offrent leurs solutions pour mettre en place les protocoles d'épidémie. Des ordonnances de l'agent de santé provinciale pour les employeurs des secteurs de la santé publique et privée et les établissements de soins de longue durée ont été émises aujourd'hui. Ces ordonnances garantissent que les employés travaillent dans un seul établissement pour réduire le risque de transmission de COVID-19. Uh, je vous remercie et we're happy to take your questions. Okay, just a uh, housekeeping. Please press star one to enter the queue to ask a question and limit yourself to one question at a time. And please unmute your phones. You will not be audible until we put you in to the queue and uh, so yes always remember to unmute your phones we will start with lisa cordasco at chly go ahead lisa thank you uh dr henry almost every day you refer to cases uh at long-term care homes on the lower mainland um without divulging the locations of towns or individuals what can you tell us about the cases here on vancouver island are, are they in care homes or in clusters or are these a bunch of individual cases yeah, so there's a, a couple of things. Um, we announce all of the outbreaks, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday. We have a protocol that we've had for many years for outbreaks in care homes, and so that's um, that's part of what we are doing to continue uh, that protocol. So there have been no care home outbreaks on Vancouver Island um, yet, and there's been a combination of people who've returned from traveling, some of them individuals, some of them have passed it on to close contacts, and others uh, have been uh, other community contacts. Um, some have uh, attended events, for example, where there have been people who've been um, who've been positive for COVID-19. So there is also, um, as we know, uh, are knowing more and more with the testing that we're doing, that there is community transmission both in Vancouver Island and across British Columbia right now. Next question comes from Matt Preprost, Alaska Highway News. Hi, Doctor. Um, how many of the cases in uh, in the Northern Health Region are related to um, to travel versus um, uh, community transmission? And um, are you able to provide any details about uh, perhaps how many people here in the North have recovered? Ah, I do have the number who have recovered. I believe it is. About. One or two, but I can get that for you. I don't have the data on uh, whether they're all travel related or not. I know the initial ones were, but my understanding is there has been some exposures. Ah, no, I stand corrected. There were five recovered cases in Northern Health. Um, so that's good news. Um, there is a mixture of uh, close contacts as well as travel related cases that I'm aware of in the North. Great. Next question comes from Ian Mulgrew at Post Media. Go ahead, Ian. Um, uh, I, this is for the minister, um, and it's about uh, the cancellation of scheduled surgeries, which means that about 3,000 British Columbians a week who have been waiting to have diagnostic treatments to find out how far cancer might have spread, as well as those who have been waiting to have treatment 
are now living with both uh, the fear that their situation is deteriorating, but also with fears of the virus. I wonder if you might speak to some of their concerns and, and when scheduled surgeries might start again and what plans you have for erasing the backlog or will they just be put back into the lengthy queues? Well, I think um, Ian and I have spoken about this four or five times. I think it's uh, of all the decisions that have been made uh, since the beginning of this, this was one of the hardest because what we call them elective surgeries, as you know, they're scheduled surgeries and they're all, uh, all important. They're all medically necessary. They're all required and cancelling them to ensure that we have the appropriate space in acute care hospitals and ICUs in critical care units um, is a necessary step. It's a step that wasn't taken in other jurisdictions, which dealt with uh, an influx of COVID-19 patients uh, while their hospitals were at 100 percent capacity. That's not what we were prepared to do in BC, so we've prepared the situation. I would note that had that happened, then obviously that would have had implications for scheduled surgeries as well. But it's this very serious question, um, uh, and I should say that in every, um, in every hospital, assessments have been made because some surgeries defined as scheduled surgeries are urgent, especially in oncology, and so those uh, surgeries continue to happen. But, uh, but the, the, you're correct. We're talking about the cancellation of thousands of scheduled surgeries, which will tell you and the opening up effectively of almost 4,000 hospital beds. That tells you effectively how seriously we take the situation, how seriously we take the need to be prepared, and how difficult these decisions are, not just for hospitals and for doctors and for nurses who are not doing the work that they were uh, born to do, that they've done to restore uh, life and movement to people who were waiting for surgeries, not just to them, but of course the many, many people who will be affected about this in the days and months to come. And yes, in this area, as in many others, there will be, uh, once we get through this, and it's going to take a while, once we get through this, urgency in getting back to work in every area, and healthcare is uh, one of the most significant ones. Uh, we operate this time of year in general, a healthcare system in the acute care sector, at 103.5 percent, which means we're uh, going to the max all the time. And so when you're op operating as we are right now, in, with a total capacity of 64 percent, that tells you that we've had to make some significant steps. I think most people will agree they're the right steps, but they're not without consequences. And obviously, we're preparing, hoping for that day that will come when we'll be able to restore those surgeries and get back to work, because that will be a huge priority. And the cost of delay will also uh, have been felt in the months uh, where things are delayed. So my heart goes with them. I've been in touch with a number of people who face this circumstance, and I, I have to say, um, many of them have been extraordinarily courageous, but also, obviously, they're worried and concerned and have this, all the same anxieties that we have about COVID-19. Next question is Victoria Chang, Ming Pao. Oh, hi. Um, Dr. Henry, uh, you mentioned that there is that, uh, um, the patients under um, age of, of 10, and that is that a, a trial. So uh, do you have any updates uh, for this trial's um, condition right now in the hospital? Uh, I don't uh, at the moment, but uh, we can provide some more information about uh, children tomorrow in our briefing. Um, I don't believe the person is still in hospital, but um, I could be wrong. Next question comes from Simran Singh, Daily Hive. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Henry. Um, with the increase of cases we see at our park center, could you please explain what carries and nurses be doing um, in that center when they come home to their families? Should they be self-isolating? And do you suggest how um, do you best suggest they do that, especially if they live with their kids or their their partner? Yeah. So people in the care homes. 
um, there's processes that we're um, putting in place around the outbreak. So yes, we do ask them to stay away, to go directly home, to, to stay home um, and stay away from others. We, if they do not have symptoms, we still feel that the risk is low for others. But we are, because we know it's a high risk setting, uh, we are asking people to, to um, take measures to prevent transmission to others. And there are ways of doing that. We've been supporting people. We have some details on how you can try and do that within your home. I know it's it's it, it's an incredible challenge for some people, and I know some people have taken that step of having their their children or their family live elsewhere or staying with others uh, during this per period of time um, when we're going through this because of the concerns about the risk. Next up is Lisa Yusta, News 1130. Go ahead. I'm wondering with this issue of social distancing, we're seeing people flying into airports. They're not distant on the planes, and then we see them crushed together or close together at the airport. How is that being managed? Yeah, so we, we've had lots of issues about talking about who gets on an airplane, who gets off an airplane, how it's all done. Um, it, you know, that is, of course, uh, managed um, by our partners in the federal government, particularly the Canadian Border Service Agency. And I know they have been taking steps to to make that more efficient and effective in terms of, of uh, distancing, physical distancing uh, in those settings. It is a challenge. Um, they, they have, as you know, restricted uh, flights coming into the country to four major airports, including YVR, and the um, processes that they've put in place have, have been ramped up. Um, I keep hearing stories, um, particularly not all of the flights from the U.S. or from some of the sun destinations go through those four airports, and uh, there is a variety of ways that um, people are managed in those settings. It, it's, it is one of those challenges. Um, we know that it's only for a short period of time and we've been uh, encouraging them and, and assisting them in ensuring they, they try and put in the best measures possible. In enhanced ha hand hygiene, making sure people are screened is something that is happening. Um, and now it will be a mandatory. If anybody has symptoms, they will be quarantined at their place of arrival. Um, and if they don't, they'll be uh, directed into uh, isolation and told uh, how they can get to their place of residence so they will not be allowed to go on public transit, for example. So there are more uh, restrictions coming in, but um, yeah, it is a challenging environment for sure. Keith Baldry, Global News. Dr. Henry, um, I know we're going to get some pretty bleak numbers tomorrow with, with the scenarios, but uh, yesterday you said you were heartened by the fact the hospitalization numbers didn't really go up as much as they had in the last couple of days, and today was barely an uptick on that front as well. So do you continue to be heartened by what you're seeing on hospitals? Um, I, I, I don't dare hope um, at this point. We're still very much in the first incubation period from when we started putting in these restrictive measures. So there are people out there who are incubating this disease. We know there's been transmission. So we are not going to see a dramatic change uh, for another five to six days. And then I'll, I'll maybe if, if we continue this way. But there are many things that can happen. We can have an outbreak in a small community. We can have a hospital outbreak. There is so many scenarios right now um, that I, you know, I, we take it day by day. And I guess reinforces again, there are many things that we need everybody to do because this is the time where we can make a difference. And the, the social distance, the physical distancing is something that all of us have to take seriously right now because that is our best buffer. It's our fire break. It's our, our firewall so that we can put out all the little sparks that are happening in our community now based on what um, what occurred five, six, seven, eight, ten days ago. Um, we're able to do that better and we can um, try and control this in a way that is going to manage our ability to, to care for people both in the hospital um, with COVID-19 but everybody else who needs health care as well. And the only way we can do that is everybody committing to taking the, the physical distancing seriously and continuing to do that on a day-to-day -day basis right now. Vaughn Palmer, Vancouver Sun. Go ahead, Vaughn. A question for Health Minister Dix. You said a while ago that you would update us on medical supplies 
when they got here, not when they were ordered. And I'm hearing reports now out of the states that some of their manufacturers and suppliers are telling customers with regret that they can't fill their orders. Um, is British Columbia hitting that problem? And is that why you were said today that really we've only had a small increase in the number of supplies and we've not had any update on the numbers you gave us 10 days ago on the number of ventilators in the system, for example. So, uh, I, and uh, I was going to say that we, uh, that 15 ventilators had arrived yesterday, and that's what we're going to do. We're expecting a, another um, arrival of ventilators tomorrow, but until they actually arrive, they're physically with us, uh, Vaughn, I won't be, and we won't be announcing anything. So, yes. We're, we're making small progress with supply. We're getting some support from the federal government. You know that the federal government has in some ways had the lead for Canada in seeking out international supply, and I know they're working very hard on that. We don't just depend on them. We're making our own significant efforts to seek large supply as well. But, but uh, a lot of uh, – there's lots of countries that export medical equipment, but uh, two of those key countries, of course, are the United States, which is – going through uh, what everyone can witness now um, if they watch uh, any kind of American television and, uh, and China which has gone through uh, has, and has sort of has come out in so, especially in some regions outside of Hubei province come out of the COVID-19 thing 19 uh, crisis for the moment and those are key suppliers but um, COVID-19 is in a hundred countries in the world and so uh, the challenges that we face are the challenge everyone's ma facing. So that's why we're taking steps locally. We're doing everything we can to use uh, the equipment we have properly, to extend out the time we have with our equipment, and we're making um, uh, enormous efforts every day to seek more supply as well. And because uh, that's our got to be our commitment to the healthcare workers, all of those healthcare workers who are out there um, preparing for COVID-19 patients or working with COVID-19 patients in the community are in acute care hospitals and making all the preparations we're making now. But uh, you're right, uh, the disruption in the United States is, um, is significant and uh, the disruption in other parts of the world is significant as well. And so uh, uh, with that in mind, we're um, giving it absolutely everything we have. Next question comes from Cheryl Jean, CKPG. Go ahead, Cheryl. Yes, this is a question for Dr. Henry, please. Um, physical distancing, uh, how do you see that being achieved in a place like a shelter? Yeah, you know, obviously a shelter is a challenging situation and there's been a number of different ways that people have been trying to address it at the, still, at the same time um, trying to meet the needs of the people who are in that um, shelter. So I know some of our shelters have, have closed um, because they've not been able to put in appropriate things like being able to distance, being able to provide the appropriate cleaning um, products, uh, having a plan to be able to isolate somebody if need be. But uh, there's a lot of work going on to try and support that. I think that the, the, when we have been thinking about um, shelters and the population in the shelters and the workers in the shelters, our real focus is on prevention and preventing it from getting into that environment. And so we're taking measures around that, screening people. Um, it, it's, it's, as we say, a challenging thing. The other part of it, though, that we have to remember is that shelters are, in many cases, um, a person's only home. Uh, for lack of a better word, and so we need to make uh, make provisions so that we can support people and do it as in the safest way possible. But it is, as as you indicate, it's a challenge, and especially in some of the larger shelters. I know there's many different ways that communities are looking at this. Some of it is moving people into smaller settings um, so that there's not as much people in uh, a, a greater number of smaller settings. And uh, here in Victoria, they're looking at some of those provisions as well. Gail Johnson, Yahoo News. Go ahead, Gail. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Henry, my question pertains to babies, so children under one year of age. Um, we're hearing occasional stories of babies either being tested for or diagnosed with novel cor coronavirus. Um, in one case out of the UK, apparently the baby's mother and even care provider initially passed off the fever as being caused by teething. Um, what should a parent or garden be looking for and when should they have their baby assessed? 
Yeah, good question. Um, as, as we know, uh, most young children uh, seem to be less affected by this, but there have been case reports, as you say, very small numbers of infants who've um, been affected by COVID-19, um, and some of them severely affected. So I think that the, the same thing applies if you have concerns about your child to make sure that you connect with your care provider and ask about um, the issues, particularly if you um, have had contact with somebody or have been in a, uh, an environment where um, COVID-19, and I say that because we have now um, several public places where we know there, there's potential exposures. So it, it's really challenging and it is a discussion that needs to be between your, your care provider and, and yourself and then in public health we can facilitate testing if it's needed. Okay, next up we have Victor Kaiser, Radio Kamloops. Victor? Okay, we're gonna move on to Richard Zussman, Global News. One of the questions uh, that we've received, Dr. Henry, or, or potentially for Minister Dix is around uh, custody battles and, and what the recommendations are uh, for people who may be going, have children that go in between parents' homes and whether that's recommended and considering the courts aren't open, how is there guidance on doing that if there's a potentially concern from one parent or the other uh, that the home uh, isn't uh, safe in terms of protecting from COVID-19? Yeah, that's a very challenging question and it's not one that I can give individual advice on, although the courts may be close, there are um, uh, ways of, of connecting with, with the legal system to uh, address your own particular individual situation and, and really that's the advice that I have to give. Um, there's no way I can say it blanket, it should be one or the other. Um, we do want to try and minimize exposure, so it, it has a lot to do with um, how you can effectively care for children in those environments and um, every situation is very different. Um, so I, I know my colleague in Quebec said uh, that they should stay with the strictest parent, but I'm not sure it's that simple. I think there, there is uh, a lot of things in family dynamics um, that need to be worked out. And uh, I, my advice to people is to, to, you know, to try and work it out in a way that uh, makes the best sense for the children. Next question comes from Amy Smart from the Canadian Press. Go ahead. Hi there. As, um, if we do reach our capacity to treat COVID-19 cases, I know some countries have implemented rules against treating people of a certain age, for example. Others are leaving those determinations up to doctors. Um, how will doctors in BC make those decisions and is there a framework in place to support them? Yes, there absolutely is. This is something that is uh, near and dear to my heart for a long time. Um, uh, you know, looking at what happened during the SARS outbreak and other things. Um, so an ethical framework about how we approach these, these questions, these incredibly important questions is something that we have, um, we developed in H1N1, we've uh, refined it during the Ebola crisis in 2014, and we've used that background with a very strong group of, of clinical um, ethicists, sorry, not clinical ethicists, ethicists in our, in our province that we've had ongoing discussions with over many years and I, I raise my hands to them. We have a, a, a really strong um, group of ethicists in this province who have assisted us on this and uh, since January when this first started, um, I tasked them with looking at um, developing the framework uh, for that we can use and adapting the framework for COVID-19 and then addressing some very specific questions. One of those is around personal protective equipment and the other one was around um, uh, it was around ventilator and decision making about um, who will get uh, scarce treatments if that comes to pass. So we do have a very detailed framework and I um, thank all of my clinical care, my nursing colleagues who, who were involved in developing this framework. Um, it does have um, a whole protocol for how we will manage this so that no any single individual physician or clinician will have to make uh, that decision on their own. There is a, a system that is being set up for clinical decision making, ethical decision making at each hospital that's involved and also a provincial strategy, a provincial, we call it a tripartite uh, appraisal um, uh, 
I'm sorry, I can't, T-A-T-T, -T, but I can't remember what it stands for. But we have uh, people at the provincial level that include um, myself and uh, uh, a critical care lead, a nursing lead, um, who will be imposing, uh, if we need to, the framework. And it will be under, uh, under the specific circumstances, and it is all laid out, the considerations that we have, the ethical principles that underlie the decisions that will be made. So it, it is, and I want to reassure my colleagues, because this is something we worry a lot about in, in health care, is having to make that decision on our own. Okay, next question is from Nick Eaglin, Vancouver Sun. Oh. Those, Hi, ethics oh, frameworks, on, Nick, those ethics frameworks will be posted publicly once they're, once they're finalized. Okay, go ahead, Nick. Hi, Dr. Henry. I'm just wondering if there's any more details you can share about the um, safe supply, like when that's going to happen and um, how that's going to be delivered to people. Uh, so this is a guideline for for providers, so physicians and clinicians who are um, supporting people who are um, living with addictions and substance use disorders. So it, it's uh, to support them in how to make those decisions. So, for example, um, I know there's a number of providers that are working in the downtown east side, and it's supporting them and being able to support um, their clientele, the people who are, are living in that community. And there's also um, backup support from the rapid response team team to be able to support the, the individual and the clinician and making sure this can all happen in a way that's safe. So the guidance is quite specific and I know it, it will if it's not already yeah. released publicly. Well, this, um, it, it's been distributed and I think you'll expect something soon, uh, Nick, that will come uh, uh, from the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions and uh, it'll be widely distributed and I think uh, as far as I, I understand it, you'll be seeing it this afternoon. Great, and we have time for one more question. Uh, Devin Bedell, Black Press, go ahead. Hi there. Um, uh, I heard earlier this week that health officials in the UK announced um, that 3.5 million antibody tests have been ordered. Can you say when or if these antibody tests could come to the province? No, we are absolutely looking for an antibody test. Um, there is still a lot of... Uh, what, there's a lot of research going on about an antibody test and what an antibody test lets you do is determine who was infected. So right now the test that we have that is being used around the world to detect cases is one that relies on uh, detecting the, the, ribal the RNA of the virus in your saliva in particular and other body fluids. And that one tells us the virus is present. So what an antibody test does is it lets me know two weeks, one week or two weeks later, if I had the infection. It's a measure of your body's response to the, to the virus. So when I'm infected with a virus, my immune system develops what we call antibodies to, to try and bind to that virus and kill it so that it can't create um, damage my, to my cells. But uh, so an antibody test is not helpful in diagnosing me right now if I'm sick, but it is helpful in having, helping us understand where in our community um, people have already had this infection. So we are absolutely looking for an antibody test. And there's been a number that are still experimental, and I know, uh, I think it was Iceland or Finland was uh, looking at doing some broad antibody testing as well. Uh, we have a, a research program that uh, we've already started um, with the VCCDC to uh, d take um, bits of sera, so blood that people have uh, donated, well, given to the lab for a whole bunch of laboratory tests, and we can take that anonymized sera, and then we have it as a baseline, and then we can do testing in um, three months, six months, once we have an antibody test, and see how what proportion of the population has actually had this disease. Really helpful, not so helpful right now in terming, determining on a day-to-day -day basis who's infected. But yeah, we're looking for it. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Very much. you.